Okay, so today we're talking about very simple proof methods in Isabel, just to get you started. Uh, and that will lead up to our practical session this afternoon when you'll be able to do simple examples using these. So by interactive proof, we normally have a few basic uh, ingredients. As I said last time, induction and simplification are the easiest and simplest proof methods that you can use, especially when you're proving something by induction. Um, we are first going to see the obvious induction rules that you'll have seen in any discrete mathematics course, like the list induction rule we had in the previous lecture. Uh, it turns out that you can have some really quite interesting induction rules and still the principles are the same. Uh, and it turns out that often the choice of induction rule has a huge impact on how difficult your proof is. Uh, I will say now we, we saw examples last time of proving things with auto. And I hinted that this had something to do with equality, but we'll look in much more detail on how rewriting actually works. Um, including some of these tricky things, uh, logical case splitting, arithmetic, and other things. Now, the idea of goal-directed proof is really kind of obvious if you look at ordinary problem solving. Um, so typically, if you have, let's say, a paper to write, you know that you have to organize your subject matter. You have to say, well, I have to write an introduction, and I have to write this and that, and then I have to do the conclusions. And you know you break down the big task into smaller tasks, and it's kind of an obvious thing we all do. Now, it's kind of funny that in interactive theorem proving, this had to be rediscovered. So there was a very famous book by Polya called How to Solve It. Maybe you've heard of it. It's often recommended still, uh, in which he talks about, in particular, the thing of breaking down a problem into sub-problems. Um, kind of obvious, but nevertheless, it is at the core of what we're trying to do. That is, you start with a thing you're trying to prove, and you have various things, often called tactics, and then in Isabel they're called methods for no good reason, that take a goal and replace it by sub-goals. Of course, if you replace a goal by zero sub-goals, that means you've solved it. Um, now, Isabel is a little weird. You see, many interactive theorem provers will have a strict tree structure where at every point you're looking at one single sub-goal and splitting it. So Isabel's a little weird in that instead of having this tree-like approach, you can blast all the sub-goals at once. This is not so much a design feature of Isabel as inherent in the way it works at a very low level. But nevertheless, it is handy to be able to simplify, let's say, 50 sub-goals at once, so I'm not complaining. Clearly, we want to eliminate all sub-goals. Now, it will turn out, um, and if you think about how mathematics is done, this strictly goal-directed style is not always what you want. So if you actually look at a real mathematical proof, they might do a bit of this kind of global structuring of the proof into smaller proofs, and then do some bottom-up calculations and kind of arrive at the result from both directions. Uh, a problem of a lot of interactive theorem provers is they are very bad at this. So they have this sub-goaling, this backward thing, which at some point feels very unnatural, and you really want to do a forward calculation. So we will see, in fact, in Isabel, you can mix them very nicely and naturally uh, when we get to these structured proofs later in the course. Um, but for now, let's look at the sub -goaling. And now we're going to see at quite a low level how some things look inside. 
So we saw this example in the previous lecture, the type of binary trees, the reflect function, um, and the theorem, this trivial theorem that says reflect to reflect gives you what you started with. Um, and there we are with, um, what do we see there? If you look at the top panel, you'll see that there is a cursor after the induct method. So we just applied an induction method. And as you know, induction in this case is going to give you two sub-goals, a base case and an inductive step, and there they are. So you can see in particular, number one uh, has reflect of reflect applied to LF, which refers to a leaf, so a trivial tree. So that's the base case. Um, and the other one, which is labeled two, so sub-goal two, is a more complicated thing, which is the inductive step of the induction. And if looking inside, so the thing with the two red arrows is pointing at what are in fact the induction hypotheses. So if you know an induction, you get to assume the thing you're proving for the substructure. So in this case, the binary tree has substructures T1 and T2. Each of them satisfies the induction hypothesis. So you see you have two copies, two induction hypotheses there. And they are actually written as part of the goal. What else have we got? Well, remember in induction, these substructures, T1, T2, and A is the label of the binary tree. So each node of the binary tree can be labeled. Uh, these are local to that particular um, induction step. So T1, T2, and A have no meaning outside this particular sub-goal. And this is indicated by the funny little arrow-like thing in front of them, uh, which says that they are locally bound in that place. Uh, finally, the, the uh, arrow there that's labeled conclusion is pointing to the last part of the induction step, which is the same thing we're trying to prove, only applied to a, a binary tree there with the uh, label A and subtrees T1 and T2. So what I'm trying to show you with this very detailed slide is simply what sub-goals look like. So that in general, you've got assumptions. They may not be induction hypotheses. So if you're proving some random thing, assumptions could become available to you for other logical reasons, but they're available local to that sub-goal. Those assumptions may refer to quantities, to things that are only local to the sub-goal, and there they are bound as bound variables there, um, and, and so on. So uh, let's move on. What I want to move up to now is how rewriting works in a bit more detail. Now, I tend to use the word simplification and rewriting synonymously, but they're not really. So simplification is uh, the more general idea of taking a complicated thing and doing all the relatively obvious stuff to it that makes it, in some sense, simpler. Uh, even the word simplification is not always that helpful because if you do it wrong, the thing that you get at the end might be much, much bigger than the thing you started with. So there's no guarantee that it's going to be simpler in a literal sense. At least it will have been processed. Now what I've got here on this slide is a different proof. If you remember from the previous lecture, we had a proof about reverse of reverse giving you the list you started with. And that proof, uh, in the induction step of that proof, that caused us a lot of trouble and we had to prove a couple of lemmas. So what we're going to see here is the state of how rewriting worked in that particular case. And again, trying to give you an idea of how rewriting works all the time. So let's just see what we've got here. So the first two lines are the recursive definitions of append and reverse. Now you say, what are all those question marks? OK, I'm trying to be really precise here. I did mention once a variable with a question mark is a thing that can be replaced by arbitrary terms. 
So when I show the question marks, I'm emphasizing to you that you can put anything you want in place of x, provided it's a well-formed term of the correct type. And you can put anything you want in place of xs, again on the first line, and for ys. All of those, you can substitute anything you like of the correct type. Um, so for the first two, those are just the, rec the, the, the cons case of append and reverse. The next, the third line is a little trickier. There are no question marks there. And that's because that is an induction hypothesis. So remember, an induction hypothesis refers to specific variables, specific, in this case, a specific less list called xs and a specific list ys. For that, those exact variables, this identity, this, this equality holds. Um, but you can't plug in anything, so you can only replace literally something with XS and YS and not with other terms. Um, last one. So this is the lemma we proved previously about append. Um, because this has been proved, it's funny because, in fact, this is here's where the question marks might feel even more confusing to you. Within the proof, they're fixed. So I'm proving for arbitrary x s y s of z x s that this associativity law holds. Once it's proved, it holds generally. And so there, I can apply this uh, associativity law for any terms I like, again, provided they have the right type. It could have been even worse than this, because as you see, three of them have these question mark variables and one of them doesn't, uh, it is in fact not impossible to have a mixture, to have, to have an identity which refers to some fixed quantities but also has you know, variables, true variables in it. Okay, so these are the rewrite rules at our disposal. And now all I'm showing you here, um, okay, there I'm emphasizing they go from left to right. If you want to use one in the opposite direction, again, you use the word flip. We will get to that. So this is a thing that we are asked to show. So what have we got here? Remember, we are trying to show that reverse of append equals append of reverse. Uh, I lied a bit earlier. I said this was about reverse of reverse. In fact, this is the lemma just before it. That is, reverse of append equals append of reverse. So that is the inductive step here. Maybe you can see it's got a cons there. And so we have to prove this. If we can prove this, we prove the inductive step, and that will prove that particular theorem. And we're going to prove it by rewriting. And now the highlighting on the slide should show you what is going on here. So the very first bit of highlighting, that is append with a cons. And with this one, we're going to use the very first rule above which is simply the definition of append with a cons, and it will be rewritten to the line just below. Then what will happen? Then we will end up with reverse applied to a cons. This again, we can use the definition, so that's the second rewrite rule up there. It will be used to rewrite this, and that will turn into the line below that. And what happens in the line below that? Now, this is a, maybe a tricky case. Now we're going to use the third rewrite rule shown there, which is the induction hypothesis. And you have to check here that the xs and ys are matching exactly, because you can't plug in any other terms for them. And they do match. So that will apply, and that will transform to the right-hand side of the third equation. And finally, um, we're left with the last one, so the associative law of append ends up being applied to the entire term. Uh, and when we do that, it transforms it into the final line. Um, and the effect of that is that we have transformed append of reverse, that is the original thing we're trying to show, into, I can't see this. What is that last thing?
Ah, this is the right-hand side. Sorry, I forgot for a moment what I'm doing. We have rewritten the left-hand side, and now we have to rewrite the right-hand side of that goal at the top. The right-hand side only has a little bit to do. So there on the right-hand side, we have a re reverse applied to cons. So that will be the definition of reverse. Um, sorry, that went ahead. Now I have to go through all these things again. Sorry about that. There's no way to go back just one. Um, that then gets rewritten to the line below. And the point is now, if you look at the bottom of the right-hand side and the bottom of the left-hand side, they are now identical, which means we've established the, um, the equality we wanted to prove there, which means we have proved the inductive step. Now, obviously, I'm not going to go through that much detail anymore, but you know, that's how rewriting works in the pure case of rewriting. Okay, um, I want to briefly mention rewriting also works for Boolean identities, and of course, Boolean identities are logical equivalences. Um, this can be quite convenient. Now, I don't want to go through these in detail. These are simply examples. Uh, so if you look at the first one, this is about the divides relation. So x divides minus y if and only if x divides y. Or the next one, AB, the product AB equals 0 if and only if A equals 0 or B equals 0, and so on. Um, this can be a useful kind of logical reasoning. In fact, it's so useful, there was a time, I hope it is over now, when uh, reasoning by logical equivalences was fetishized to such an extent that um, a guy named David Greaves at Cornell wrote an entire book on discrete maths in which all the proofs were done by um, a logical identities uh, and they weren't all kind of natural and obvious ones like those. A lot of them were totally weird looking things. But if you've committed yourself to using logical identities alone and nothing else, you might get tangled up in knots a bit. So we are not as dogmatic as that, but certainly logical identities can be useful. Um, I want to show you the last one because it illustrates an interesting phenomenon. So the last one says, AC is less than or equal to BC, if and only if, what exactly? Well, this is an inequality, um, and I guess you know this. Is, let's say we're working with the real numbers, just to be totally concrete here. Um, you can cancel out this common factor of C depending on the sign. And so to a mathematician, yeah, this is perfectly obvious, right? Um, if C is positive, it'll be A less than or equal to B. And if C is negative, it is B less than or equal to A. Uh, and what happens, in fact, if C is 0? Interesting. So if C is 0, um, in fact, you see the left side of this will be trivially true because everything is 0. And on the right side will be trivially true because the preconditions will both be false. So this is a. Um, not a kind of rewriting you would necessarily want to apply every time because you see you're doubling the formulas. Uh, they're making a double copies of A and B and this is, and indeed C. This is the sort of thing which if you do it carelessly you will get not merely a six page formula but, but conceivably something that will never terminate because the exponential growth is, is um, not going to fit inside your computer. Uh, nevertheless, we actually do this kind of case splitting all the time. So you just need to know what you're doing. OK. Um, we have the if and only if symbol available, and it will look a bit nicer than that. OK. Now, continuing. We've already seen an example of a case split there on the sign of C. There is a more general kind of case splitting, which it can be very powerful. So let's suppose that so we've got an if-then-else thing in Isabel Hall's logic. So this is a term that you can write, for example, if x equals 0, then y else z, something like that. And it has an obvious meaning. It's just like a conditional in a programming language. 
Now by P here, I mean any context. So anything containing the if then else. Now, if you have this in a goal you're trying to prove and you call for a simplification, it will turn that into this. So it will get rid of the if then else for you. So this is kind of analogous to the thing we saw with the inequality where there are basically two possibilities, right? Either B is true or B is false. If B is true, that expression is X, and if B is false, that expression is Y. Now, why do we do this? Um, this is kind of one of our pragmatic decisions. We do it because mostly it's useful. So mostly, um, if that else is, are ugly things to deal with, and getting rid of them and just putting in the two cases gives us exactly what we want. Uh, we, this is where these pragmatic decisions get a bit annoying. If you have the exact same thing as an assumption, nothing will be done to it. And the reason is if you did it to an assumption of a goal, you would get two goals. That is one where the B is true and the other where the B is false. And I guess we don't like the idea that you simplify a goal and get two goals. That is not what people, how people normally understand simplification. Nevertheless, you can ask for it to happen, in which case it will happen. Um, it's also quite useful. Um, it turns out when you define other things that have a notion of uh, alternative cases, you can set it up to happen automatically. And if you do it right, it can solve a lot of things for you. Okay, let's move on. Again, I'm, at the moment, I'm sticking to the theme of rewriting, and we're looking at some slightly more advanced notions of rewriting. So what about the first rule there? Um, we've got some law about lists. So the uh, at sign stands for append. That's the real one. It's nothing to do with email, guys. Uh, and it turns out that particular uh, identity only holds if the variable xs is non-empty. So if I have a non-empty list, this says the head of that append is equal to the head of the first list. Uh, what is the next one? The second one is something to do with successor and minus. Now because those are natural numbers, the minus operation doesn't always behave naturally. So we need that condition n less than or equal to m. Um, and the last one, it involves division, and it's only valid if um, the two uh, factors of the divisor are non-zero, naturally enough. Oh, by the way, the weird ASCII characters, I just think of that as a conjunction, A non-zero and B non-zero. So they are conditional. Um, by the way, I can tell you a dirty secret. In, in Isabel, and in fact many interactive theorem provers, division by zero is defined to equal zero, and there are plenty of identities involving division that are completely unconditional because it turns out that even if the divisor is equal to zero, the two sides are the same, so it doesn't matter. See, um, in fact, here I think it doesn't matter whether A is zero or not because in fact if A is zero, both sides collapse to zero anyway. Maybe I should change this one. So what do we do with conditional rewrite rules? The idea is to match the left-hand side of the rule itself. So in the first one, that would be the head of the list append to the other list. If that matches, then you, that will create an instance of the precondition, which you then try to solve using simplification again. Funny thing is, this was first invented in the 1970s. Yeah, amazing, something that's 40-something years old, nearly 50 years old, is still useful today in almost the same form. This is in, in the original Boyer and Moore theorem prover from about 1975. And yes, if you're able to prove the precondition, use the rewrite rule. Um, 
Yeah, it's very useful because a lot of our rewrite rules really are conditional. And there I've highlighted the left-hand sides for you just in case. So those are the patterns that have to match in order to apply these rules. Now, sadly, rewriting can easily go into a loop. Now, if you're using Isabel J edit, um, you'll know that the simplifier is in a loop because your proof method will start glowing red right on the screen in front of you. It can be a bit alarming for the first time, but it's like it's not radioactive or anything. It is wasting a lot of processor time and running down your battery, but it's not doing any other harm. So what can cause a simplifier to loop? Well, it can be really obvious things, like if you have these two rewrites, it's pretty obvious that the first one will match any instance of F applied to a thing, replace it by something that has a G in it, and then if G rewrites as something with an F in it, you're in trouble. So don't do that. Of course, it's very easy for me to say don't do that, but a typical Isabel setup will have many thousands of rewrite rules simultaneously installed. So you have to hope that nobody who was putting in rewrite rules um, all the developers who've been installing them and they can just kind of apply this simp attribute anywhere in bingo it's a rewrite rule. You have to hope that none of them made a mistake, but generally it's fine. Um, this is a trickier one. Actually, this one, this particular one, um, okay, so every x satisfying the property p is equal to zero. The trouble with that is that it will match absolutely anything because x just matches everything. Then it says, right, um, show that x satisfies the property p. So p will, presumably it has x in it, and every time it sees an x, it will apply the very same rule and try to show once again that x satisfies the property p. So that is also not a good one. Um, this is a funny case. So what about x plus y equals y plus x? Uh, it is built in. So the simplifier knows about so-called permutative rewrite rules. So this, in a very general sense, if the right side is, is an instance of the left side, um, it will say, aha. Uh, and uh, well. It does some clever thing which, in fact, makes it easy for you to not merely cope with that, but you can use it to normalize, as I'd say, arithmetic expressions where you have, let's say you have plus and you have times, uh, and you would like them to be sorted so that the things you're adding are, the same, are in the same order on, let's say, the left and right-hand side of an equation you're trying to prove. Uh, and maybe you want all the factors and brackets to be multiplied out. Um, it's very easy to ask the simplifier to do that. And just because it will, you can get everything basically sorted, it, we can use rewriting to actually sort the terms that make up your expression. And that is a quick and dirty way to prove a lot of stuff. That, again, goes right back to the 1970s. <coughs> Okay, we get a Dilbert. Don't mention that I gave you this idea. Right, now I need to connect all the stuff you've just seen to actual Isabel proofs. Uh, and that is mostly through simp and auto. So, We've just seen what simplification is. Now, if you apply simp, it will do what I just told you about to the, what do I mean by the first sub-goal? Well, it's very simple. If you're looking at your Isabel J edit and it has goals one, two, three, up to 50, God protect you if you have 50, um, it will do number one. Auto will do all of them. Auto does other stuff. So auto also knows about logic. So the point of auto, I should say, is to do all the dumb stuff. 
Now again, if, if you have got 50 sub-goals, it's very often the case that almost all of them are true for absolutely trivial reasons. And there's a couple of really hard things in there. Think of it as a kind of food processing where you kind of get rid of the soft stuff and you want to get out the, any stones that you can then deal with them separately. So auto will do a, a lot of very simple logical reasoning, so it'll break up your conjunctions and your disjunctions and make a lot of cases, do all the simple things with quantifiers and try and prove everything it can um, and leave you the stuff it doesn't know how to prove. This is not always the way to get a final beautiful proof. So often this is a way to explore your problem Typically then, once you've found the hard things you have to prove, you might get a nicer looking proof if you take that hard thing that it identified, write it as a kind of separate lemma, prove it as a separate lemma, and then if you call, kind of then you can restructure your proof so that that hard case won't appear anymore because you supplied it as lemma. Um, but anyway, I'll talk more about style later. So let's look at how we actually call, and I forgot, because I've been telling you about flip, and I forgot to update the slides. But what can you do? So this is allowing you to refer by name to a previous lemma that is not installed by default. Well, how, what is installed by default? If remember, if when you prove the theorem, you have the word simp in square brackets, it's installed to be used by default. For all the others, you can add them using this add keyword, it doesn't actually check whether simplifying with that is a good idea or not. So this is your own responsibility to choose appropriate things. Um, sometimes you need to delete something. If you find yourself using Dell a lot, it is a good sign that the thing that was added should never have been added in the first place. So you don't see Dell that often. You do sometimes see flip, which I forgot to put on this slide. Uh, oh, you couldn't use flip with rev rev because that would replace everything by rev rev of it and then it would loop. So, but there are plenty of things where uh, it does make sense to flip the orientation of a, of a theorem. Okay, what is that mysterious no ASM simp? Um, these are very rarely used, and actually you can forget about them for this course. But in general, when you say simplify, it simplifies the whole sub-goal, including not only the, the final conclusion you're trying to prove, but all the induction hypotheses and all the other stuff that's there as well. There are rare occasions when you want to stop the simplifier from looking at certain parts of the goal. So no ASM simp is one of several, ah oh, yeah, there is this thing called no ASM. That says ignore the assumptions completely as if they weren't there. And the other two says don't simplify the assumptions. You will almost never need either of those actually, but anyway, they're there. Finally, simp all is the same as simp except it applies to all the sub goals. Now what about auto? You might say auto and simp all are the same, but in fact, auto knows about logic as well. So auto is, made, I guess, the most general of these. It does logic as well as simplification. And if you want to use del, you have to write simp del. And in fact, if you want to write want to use flip, you have to write simp flip in order to reorient a rewrite rule. Now, just to give you something pragmatic, I mentioned already that we have this wonderful permutative rewriting system. And it turns out you can, I, I said you can use it like to sort the term, subterms of a formula and so on. And to do this, it generally helps to take not a single rewrite rule, but a list of rewrite rules and bundle them in together. Now, you can do this very easily. So a, a, an identifier does not have to be a single theorem, but a list of theorems. And a number of useful ones are built in. 
So if you're working on a problem that involves arithmetic, and by the way, the type doesn't matter. So when I say arithmetic, it could be natural numbers, integers, reals, complexes, or quaternions. Um, you might find these useful. So add AC is the, ad the associative commutative properties of addition. And all it will do is sort the things being added. Multi AC is similar, but for multiplication. So if you have a bunch of stuff multiplied together, simplify with that. You'll find all the factors will be sorted in alphabetical order. Um, algebra sims. So if here you've got complicated algebraic expressions that you think would be the same if you multiplied everything out, you can try that. What if you've got division as well and you think that it would work on all you need to do is multiply out all the uh, divisors, all the fractions, and just multiply everything by brute force. You can try these. Let me warn you, if, if that doesn't solve the goal, you might have an awful mess afterwards. Um, but anyway, these, all of these refer to uh, very caref carefully crafted collections of theorems that were put together. You can even think of them as little programs to do useful things for you. That's probably a true story, so I hope you find it inspiring. Okay, moving on. Um, you're going to prove a lot of stuff by induction in this course, so let's figure out how it's done. Uh, first, the obvious thing, every theorem you're going to prove, uh, we begin with the theorem lemma, uh, the, with the keyword lemma, a name, and maybe an attribute like simp. Oh, by the way, if everything is a lemma, you might say, where are the theorems? Well, you can use theorem if you like. Now, mathematicians tend to reserve theorems for a couple of really important things. So a mathematical paper will typically have only one theorem in it and a whole bunch of lemmas. But that's why that, and sometimes you see proposition for a thing which is kind of of intermediate importance. So you can vary them if you like, if you get bored of lemmas. Um, now, to prove a thing by induction, now this is a funny thing. I, uh, twice now I've talked about things invented in the 1970s. Already in the 1970s, Boyer and Moore invented some really cool heuristics for looking at a formula involving recursively defined functions and figuring out the best possible induction to do to prove the whole thing automatically. Um, almost nobody uh, implements these heuristics. Uh, it is a funny thing. Now, maybe it's that people like to do their own induction, or maybe that we find obvious. It's not always obvious, and in fact, choosing the wrong induction is going to cause, probably every year, causes some students a lot of grief. I try and give you some hints on how to do it. Nevertheless, for Isabel and for basically uh, Almost every auto, uh, interactive theorem prover I know, you have to do the induction yourself. So you have to identify the induction variable. First of all, you have to decide that induction is necessary in the first place. Because maybe, obviously, a lot of facts follow without induction from other facts. But if induction is necessary, it's your job to decide it's necessary, you will find uh, some variable typically of a type which is inductively defined like natural numbers. Um, typically the, the, this variable will be the argument of recursive function of course you're trying to prove something about the recursion. Um, a lot of complications could happen which we will look at in a moment. So once you, I don't know why that says completing the proof, let's say starting the proof, you have to use the induction method, it's called. Don't be confused. I know we have slides that have induct. Induct and induction are almost the same. They differ in some. 
very minor details. Um, yes, your first sub goal will be the, the base case. There are one or two really weird theorems in which the inductive step is trivial and you have a huge amount of labor to prove the base case. But they are very rare. So your base case, generally if your base case isn't trivial, you're in trouble. Um, and you have to do the other ones. You try auto. Um, and that's it for doing a basic proof by induction, certainly for the practical we're going to have it in a moment. Now I want to remind you or give you a bit more detail about Isabel J. Edit. Now we saw a bit of it last time. Uh, I said some of these things before. Has any of you ever come across J. Edit as an editor before? No? Yeah, it, it did exist. It has now been kind of absorbed into Isabel. Now, the funny thing is, um, as it says there, it might feel a little weird at first, especially if you're used to other interactive theorem provers, so especially if you load in someone else's development that already exists. So what you then see is what looks like an editor window with all your Isabel's code in it, and you're thinking, what's happening? Um, and things you can't see anything because it will have, assuming your, the code is correct, it will have processed it all probably by the time you can see it, unless your machine is very slow. It will have processed everything as a, using parallelism down to a very low level, including if you have any errors, it will try and go around the errors and continue processing. Um, and you won't see anything unless you look in one of the appropriate panels. So it takes a while to figure out that it's even there. But you, what you should do is play around a lot. And there's loads of stuff that isn't even documented. Or there's also things that are kind of in the JEdit editor that were kind of cool and were built in and then maybe forgotten that you can explore. So this hover click, what do I mean by that? Well, you just hold down Control, I think. Take your mouse, hover over different elements and it will then change color or something. And then if you click on it, it typically takes you to the definition of that thing. So this can be very cool. So if you click on certain Isabel keywords, it will take you right into the source code and you can find out where that keyword was implemented, which is probably of no value to you. But much more usefully, if you look at, let's say there's a logical function there, click on that and take you to the definition of the function wherever it may be inside Isabel and anywhere in the source development. Um, so there's, it does a lot of super cool stuff and I really would encourage you to play around because there's tons of stuff um, th that I don't know about. It's like a, it's an endless computer game in fact. Okay, I mentioned <coughs> the, doc the dockable panels. Um, what have we got here? So, <coughs> I'm sorry, it's a slightly old image. Yeah, none of this will exactly work anymore. But it doesn't matter. I mean, the, the, the gist is still the same. The output panel can show you the proof state. There is now a state panel which you can display instead, which I normally do. But if you like to have the output panel, then it will show you, in this case, you see, you're able to see what your sub goals are. You're also able to see any error messages or any other warnings or, or comments that come out of the system. Uh, what's happening there is I think I hover clicked over probably the variable n. It tells us it's a variable and it tells us its type. Uh, and if I'm not mistaken, you can probably hover click over even the type NAT and get taken to the definition of that type inside the system. So everything is, is kind of clickable in a very intriguing way. Um, you need to very carefully watch the colors of things. So, so you see in that definition of the function ACK, variables there are blue. I can't actually tell you what all the colors mean. Um, but 
here, looking at the blue ones, so the blue ones look like free variables. Looking in the sub goals down below, you see they're green, not blue, and those are bound variables. And usually, sometimes you will see a variable in a rather ugly red color. That is generally is a warning to you that that variable is not kind of connected to anything. So if you're in the middle of a proof and you typically you misspell the name of a variable, that means it won't be bound by anything, um, but it also won't have been given any kind of meaning within the context of your proof. It will appear as kind of red, and you might be able to prove stuff about it, because you know, x equals x, right, regardless of whether x is meaningful or not. Um, but you have probably made a mistake, and if you see, so you feel, I'm just saying, watch the colors carefully. Um, This is the documentation panel, and you'll see you can click on loads of different things. The top one there is a general tutorial, which is quite useful if you, if you want an independent introduction to Isabel apart from this course. You can work through that. Uh, a lot of the other documentation is very specialist stuff, which you probably won't need. I haven't read most of it. Um, what have we got? Sidekick. Sidekick will not be useful until you've got a really big theory. But if it is, it turns out you can put a lot of LaTeX like section and subsection commands in a theory. Because, you know, the, a theory could be 10,000 lines long, right? Quite easily. And at that point, you may well have structured it as a kind of LaTeX document and sectioned and subsectioned it down to many levels. And the sidekick will then give you a kind of perspective view of the whole thing. It's very useful to navigate. The theories thing there, again, probably only useful if you're in a big development where if you've got, let's say, 20 theories and you want to see which ones are loaded, you can then click on a theory name and it will then, you'll then leap into that theory. So um, lots of cool stuff. As I said, play around. So in the next hour you will, is your first opportunity to play around, and you really should. Now, another thing I want to mention. Um, as a general rule, see, if you look in that, is that called the gutter or something, that thing on the left side? So you look at that gutter. Um, when you see a little blue eye, that is a hint to you that something possibly cool or maybe nasty is happening. Well, if you see something red in the gutter, that definitely tells you something is wrong. What's wrong with the red is that you've got end, but there is no proof for the theorem above. So that's why end is not allowed there. Um, but what you've got there, where the blue one is, is you've got a little message from the system that says, whoops, that's not true. And of course it's not true. Look, it says reflect of a tree equals the same tree. Well, that's not true, right? Remember what reflect does? It makes turns a thing into that. So of course it's not a self-identity. And it actually gives you an example. It says, look at a binary tree that has you know, a thing here, a leaf there, uh, but then a branch there. And you reflect it, and it won't equal itself. So it's really cool that Isabel has a subsystem inside that can automatically um, check certain things. If, you, if your, your sub-goal, yeah, I mean, your, the property you want to check needs to be sufficiently concrete and sufficiently computational in a certain sense. So this is not going to work if you're talking about, I don't know, continuous manifolds or some such advanced kind of mathematical thing. But very often we're talking about computational data structures. And in fact, even more, as long as it's got a certain amount of finiteness in it. It's very powerful. Um, and clearly, this is going to save you a lot of time. Because, OK, that's obviously false. But I have to say, a lot of the time, um, I have relied on this. So that one is nitpick. The previous one was called a quick check. These are different counterexample finders. Quick check works by in a clever way, simply trying lots of that random values and seeing if it finds a counterexample. Nitpick 
works by translating an abstraction of the problem into a SAT problem and running a SAT solver. So these are completely different ways of finding counterexamples. Uh, nitpick is incredibly powerful and general. So I, in, in fact, in a research thing I did it within the last year where I had some fiendishly tricky um, declarations of things, you know, much too tricky to get your head around, and yet with enough finiteness in them that I could take what I thought was a theorem and apply nitpick, and I would say, nope, change it a bit, nope, change it a bit, nope, and you know, it really is a very powerful tool when you can get it to use.